the Airbus A320. One of the most popular passenger jets in the sky. Every day around the world, thousands of passengers board this plane. When they do, they walk through what would seem to be an obvious weak spot in the fuselage, the door. Any hole in the fuselage is a potential danger. So engineers designed passenger doors that can't be opened in flight. It is virtually impossible, I don't use that word very easily, but it is impossible for a passenger to open a plug-type door in flight. Passenger doors are plug-type doors. They're built to be slightly larger than their frames. When a plane takes off and pressurizes, the atmosphere inside the aircraft seals the door shut. That door probably has 10,000 or more pounds of pressure holding it firmly in place in that door frame. And you have to pull it out of that door frame to get it open. But not all doors on an airplane are built the same. Even designs that seem flawless on paper can rip apart in the real world. February the 24th, 1989, Honolulu Airport. United Airlines 811 is bound for Auckland, New Zealand. Expected flying time, nine and a half hours. There are 355 people on board, plus a full load of cargo. The doors close on time, and the plane leaves the gate just after 1.30 in the morning. Tell them we can handle 33 if it's available. Okay. We did notice that there were thunderstorms so 100 miles south, right on course, which was rather unusual for that time of night. So I left the seatbelt sign on. Captain Cronin's decision to keep that sign on will save lives. As the 747 climbs past 7,000 meters, passengers sitting just above and behind the cargo door begin to hear a strange noise. Kind of a grinding noise. I heard a, like a thud. The hell? In the next nanosecond, it was pure, unadulterated pandemonium. The next thing I knew, I found myself on the stairwell hanging on to the rungs, and I immediately knew it was an explosive decompression. Everything on the airplane that wasn't fastened down, tied down, or secured what became airborne. Um, the noise was incredible. The 747's cargo door had torn off, ripping away a section of the fuselage. The pressurized oxygen in the cabin shot out with explosive force. And as I looked up, that was the first time I saw this tremendous hole on the side of the aircraft that was just a void. And seats were missing. And I immediately knew that we had lost passengers. Everything in front of us was gone. Where we were sitting, we were about six inches from the hole. So there was nothing in front of us or to the side of us. The whole side of the plane was gone. Actually, our feet were dangling on the hole, and uh, I first thought we, we weren't going to make it. You know, I just didn't think there was any hope. The situation is desperate, but by itself, an explosive decompression won't bring a plane down. In 811, there's a hole as big as Tulsa on the side of this thing. I mean, it's an aerodynamic disruption of massive proportions, but if it was designed the way we had designed things a long time ago, it would have unzipped. After the door came off, eventually a row of rivets held, keeping the plane from pulling itself apart. But the gaping hole is putting massive stress on the aircraft. The flight crew needs to descend as fast as possible. Left, right, valves on. Start dumping the fuel. I am dumping. Struggling to fly their badly damaged jet, the crew turned back to Honolulu Airport. And all of a sudden, we were slowing down, slowing down. And I, I said, oh my god, we've landed. We're, we're on, on ground. 
probably the best landing I've ever made. When we uh, finally stopped on the runway, we deployed all 10 chutes and the flight attendants evacuated all of passengers. Thanks to the experienced flight crew, United Airlines 811 landed with everyone on board alive. But nine passengers were missing, sucked out of the plane when the fuselage tore open, taking with it five rows of seats. One of those passengers was a New Zealander on his way home, Lee Campbell. We got a phone call from Chicago and they just said that they, they regret to inform us that our son was missing, presumed dead. In the wake of their son's tragic death, Kevin and Susan Campbell embark on an international mission to discover exactly why the door had come off the plane. Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. Two months after the accident, the National Transportation Safety Board holds preliminary hearings. During a break, the Campbells take matters into their own hands. They remove several boxes full of files. So we quickly realised we'd got a really good set of papers with a lot of things that hadn't been released to the public. We were able to really start our investigation in earnest at that stage. The unpublished documents reveal a disturbing catalogue of problems with the 747's forward cargo door, going right back to its original design. Passenger doors are plug doors, but most cargo doors on jets open outward. This increases the space for luggage and other cargo. As the plane gains altitude, the pressure inside the jet presses outward against the door. To prevent the door from opening, Boeing had installed what it believed was a foolproof locking system. What they do is they build in multiple redundancies to make sure the door is properly latched and does not open. Uh, and you, you build it in to a point of, uh, that it's extremely improbable that the door would ever open. The Campbell's research uncovers two major flaws with the 747 cargo doors. The first involved the locking system. To lock the cargo doors, electric motors turn C-shaped latches around pins in the doorframe. A handle then moves arms or locking sectors over the top of the C-latches to prevent them from reopening. But on flight 811, the supposedly foolproof system had failed. Kevin Campbell built a model of the 747 cargo door latch. It showed the first deadly flaw in the locking system. Aluminium locking sectors could not hold the sea latch in place if the latches started to open on their own. With the aluminium locking sectors, if the sea locks tried to backwind, open electrically, it would just push the locking sector out of the way. It just simply wasn't up to the job that it was designed for. But what would cause the sea lock to backwind? The Campbells didn't have the answer, but they knew they were onto something. During their research, they learned that two years before Flight 811, a Pan Am 747 out of Heathrow had pressurization problems as it climbed to cruising altitude. The pilot was forced to turn back. When they got back to Heathrow, they found that the door was hanging open an inch and a half at the bottom, and all of the locks were open. When it got to the maintenance base, they found that uh, all of the, the locking sectors were either bent or broken. The passengers on this flight were lucky. They had survived the faulty locking system. But why had the sea latches turned and bent the locking sectors? As the Campbells continue to search, a Pan Am report surfaces that lays out a critical issue with the cargo door's electrical system. When the cargo door's outer handle is placed in the closed position, a master lock switch should disconnect the power supply. This would stop the sea latches from turning. But something was wrong with the switch. There was power to the, the door locks with the, uh, with the 
outer handle closed and the lock started to move and it started to force the locking sectors out of the way. The faulty power switch and weak locking sectors were no match for the pressurized oxygen inside the plane. After years of being pushed by the Campbells, the NTSB produces a report that agrees. There was an inadvertent failure of either the switch or the wiring that caused an uncommanded opening of the door. It's nice that other people know that you're right and had been all along and that the support that they had given you was, you know, was vindicated. I couldn't have lived with myself if we had done no investigating ourselves. It was just something we both felt we needed to do. We didn't even discuss it. We just knew that's what we would do. After United Flight 811, the locking system on the Boeing 747 cargo doors was changed. Inspections were increased. Another potential cause of explosive decompression had been found and eliminated. That is an amazing accolade to what we've learned, not just Boeing, but what we've learned about maintenance, about structures, maintaining them and inspecting them. Since the first jet engines pushed planes higher in the sky, the aviation industry has struggled to harness and contain the deadly power of pressurized oxygen. They know all too well that a single flaw can lead to a terrifying decompression. But more than 15 years after United 811, another deadly lesson is learned. It's August the 14th, 2005. For almost an hour, Helios Flight 522 has been circling the skies over Athens. Helios 522, over. Its flight crew has stopped communicating with air traffic control. Fearing a terrorist attack, the Greek Air Force scrambles two fighter jets to circle the mystery aircraft. One of them was actually in a shooting position behind uh, the 737. The other one was nearby the cockpit and he was trying to communicate visually with the person in the cockpit. The fighter pilots can't see any damage to the jet. No holes in the fuselage. There is no structural failure, there is no fire, there is no problem, obvious problem, from the external view with the plane. Someone in the cockpit waves at the fighter pilot, but all too soon the jet loses altitude and falls towards the ground. All 121 people on board are killed. It's the worst air crash in the history of Greece. Within minutes, investigators are on the scene. So we climbed over the hill and there we were, you know, facing this uh, situation which was beyond any, any, any description. I saw uh, a great area in front of me which was burning. It was black. Burning, people spread, pieces of, of, uh, of the airplane. The autopsies add more mystery to the case. Everyone on board the Helios flight was alive up to the moment of the crash. They did not die from inhaling a toxic substance in the airplane or from an explosion. These people died on impact. But if the passengers were alive until impact, why didn't the fighter pilot see more activity on the plane? Akrivos Tsolakis is the lead investigator. He begins to dig through maintenance records. He learns that on the day of the crash, the rear door had been inspected for leaks. Before it took off on its last flight, the Helios jet arrived in Cyprus with a problem. During the trip, the cabin crew had heard loud banging and saw ice on a rear service door. 